Okay, good, uh, I think it's afternoon, yeah. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, I'm Abu Bakar Siddiq Angu. Uh, I'll be talking about how open source can help us to reduce bias in AI. Uh, this is a bit of a feather session. So, and uh, uh, I think at some point in the session, I'll open up for us to have some conversation based on some of the things I've shared and some other solutions or suggestions that you might have in we all finding ways to solve this together. A little bit about me, I'm a developer advocate at GitLab. I'm also a community lead for the Inclusive Naming Initiative and I'm passionate about diversity and inclusion. Okay, it's not a cliche about how AI has impacted our lives. We, uh, in every, uh, anywhere you go, anywhere you look, there are ways to see how AI has improved, either mobility or academics, different ways. In the, uh, according to a report that was released recently, even in terms of the economy, there are now more developments that is happening across all industries, all. Well, let's say all basically, because there are every industry is looking for ways to increase efficiency, increase productivity, and one way they are achieving that, at the expense of workforce sometimes, but one way they are achieving that is using AI. Klarna has been in the news about how they are reducing some of their workforce because they are using AI for some of their customer support services. So AI is impacting us positively and also negatively in some ways. Now, the, according to this report, there has been a number of increases in incidents. Incidents can be maybe some malicious use of deepfake or some injustices that have been done due to wrong use of results that were generated by AI. Or I think a colleague was sharing with me about uh, some HR tool that was using some models at one time to based on some of the conversations and some of the data of employees can suggest to a manager ah uh, maybe you should have some conversation with this employee or maybe you should put him on PIP or maybe you should get fired see these are some of the things that are impacting our lives negatively and there is almost on a daily basis increase and this is probably based on some this number is probably wrong. There might be more out there that are not shared. I think there, I was reading something about some of the, yeah, there was an AI news one time where someone killed himself because the AI suggested him to go ahead with it. After sharing some personal feelings, experiences, and so on. So the way AI is being pushed to us all is that Ethiopia where we'll get to and AI can get everything done for us. But there has been an increase in a lot of problems that are directly or indirectly due to AI. And one of them is bias. Yeah, we hear this a lot. Now, the, for this chart, one of the tools that were used by the researchers is to share a survey across the globe and weigh the responses that people give then ask AI the same thing. Then now compare the responses with the responses from AI. And it saw that there is a very high tendency for the AI to respond like the responders from the Western countries. This most likely can be based on some of the information that has been fed into the AI models. Some of the data that have been used to train the AI models. So definitely their responses will be similar to Western countries. Okay, if you ask, let's say someone in South Sudan, what they think about the global economy. You might get a response, but compared to asking someone in California, it will be a totally different response. So, but then this might not be a problem by itself, but when we now have tools that is open to everyone to use, to ask questions, to learn, then they are getting perspectives based on data trained with knowledge of someone that is based in California or someone based in Europe. You end up having information or knowledge that are skewed 
towards a particular direction to, of, of the globe or where uh, I think there was uh, uh, some stories about some of the crises that are happening in the world where if you ask AI it gives an American politician kind of response <laughs> yeah, you understand and it's clear yeah it's getting this from somewhere so and also a lot of problems come from how tokenization happens tokenization is how ai breaks some of this model breaks the prompts that you give to it a lot of it are more inclined towards the english language yeah for example in in this example that we have here the same sentence in english and in vietnamese the same thing but it takes seven tokens for english and 16 tokens for vietnamese and these AI models do all this training based on the number of tokens. The more the tokens, the more the resources that needs to be consumed for the tokenization, the more time that will be taken. And the more, for all this training is powered by dollars. So companies will not be incentivized to train models that will be more expensive and likely less used. For example, if you I, uh, I'm from Nigeria, I speak Hausa and Yoruba and you train a model at a very expensive cost in Yoruba and probably you only get 1% use. There won't be incentive for you to train more. But with English, you have billions of people across the globe that speak English, that are using the tool in English. There is more incentive to focus resources on training for the English language, which at the end of the day will be to the disadvantage of those who are not English speakers. Now let's see some of examples of bias that have been in the news. This is very popular. Facial recognition, misidentifying people or uh, classifying people wrongly. Yeah, it's based on what they are trained on, but it becomes a problem where some of these things are used in, for example, crime prevention, are used for uh, in situations that make decisions about people's lives. That is where it becomes a problem. Now, another example is hiring algorithms. There is uh, uh, there was some news about a very big company that had I don't want to mention names, <laughs> so it doesn't uh, look uh, negative for any company where they, they have some models that they've created based on historical records of how recruitment is done in the company, then they later discovered that all the biases and prejudices from how the recruitment is done was transferred into the AI model. And at the end of the day, they have recruitment practices that favors technical rules more for men than women, which is very negative. Now, a very popular one that happened on Twitter some uh, earlier this year was this. It's a honest tweet. Someone from Paul Graham, someone sent me a cold email proposing a Nova project. Then I noticed it used the word Delve. A lot of conversations, threads, back and forth, very hot takes later. You understand, it's not the use of the word that is the problem. He even gave a chance to defend himself. The use of the word dev had an optic from 2022, which says something. Okay, AI, chat, GPT, and others started becoming popular around that time. Then the word dev suddenly became popular. So most likely, if someone uses this word, it's most likely chat GPT. But one of the things that people said was, if the word is not common to you, it's a commonplace in non-native speakers. In Nigeria, Delve is very common. Even someone in secondary school or primary school knows, oh, now let me delve into the discussion of the day. It's very normal. People from Kenya, from other places, felt this is normal. Now, whether you use the word or not use the word is not a problem. But let's look at his second sentence. Then I noticed he used the word delve, which means he has made a decision whether to proceed or not to proceed with the person just because of this word. 
Now, how do we know the list of words that VCs or companies are now looking to decide whether to engage or not with us? That is the problem. In the Twitter discussions, that is where a lot of people start saying, oh, no wonder I always drag with my editors. No wonder when I go to, when I travel from maybe somewhere in Africa to the UK, I'm being told that I'm trying to impress with my English. I'm being told because a lot of us grew up living with our dictionaries. Hey, you need to use your words, build your vocabulary. That is what we grew up with. Now, we are trying to use our vocabulary. We are now being told, huh, oh, you are probably chat GPT. <laughs> so that is one of the problems with bias. Now, how do we solve some of this problem? That is where open source comes in. Open source is known to foster collaboration. We are at Open Source Summit. What's the genesis of all this? Linus Torvalds pushing out his code, collaboration. Several decades, we have some of the most powerful tools to build almost everything. Well, not everything, almost everything runs Linux somewhere. And this is the power of collaboration, transparency everywhere. People adding their own contributions and building onto what we have today. These are some of the ways that we can make AI to be truly inclusive because with the way tools are going these days, a lot of companies want to make money and part of making money is, yeah, we have globalization. We release a new phone today is in every part of the globe. Ah, Apple intelligence is everywhere. Uh, whatever tool, Samsung intelligence is everywhere. But then what data were these things trained from? And how do we make sure they are representative or to an extent we are able to identify these biases or these things that have been built unintentionally into these tools. Now, some of the strategies we can deploy is ensuring we have diverse data. Now, there was a time when all of these discussions about Delve or not Delve happened, and someone mentioned, do we know that some of the training for chat GPT and classification we are done by Kenyans. When I even dug the news up, I saw there was a time there was a protest in Kenya about the contractor that ChatGPT was, uh, OpenAI was using, paying $2 per hour, and there was, and people, because of some of the things they were seeing from the data classification, were depressed, some were suicidal, and so on. Now, okay, someone in Kenya is training ChatGPT for the use of someone in the US and Europe and that person's prejudices will go into the training only for it to be labeled as AI later. So having diverse data, not just using certain individuals in certain places, but ensuring that we have data from different parts of the globe will ensure that we have more fair AI. Now, cognitive diversity is a very huge thing. When it comes to research papers we are very good at oh we let's call a conference let people come and share their papers oh you are writing a paper where did you what are your citations what are your references we want to ensure that there is a lot of value and credibility to your work the same thing with ai we should be able to get a lot of diversity in terms of knowledge that we are putting into some of these models for example Someone in the, let's say, I'm based in Netherlands. In Netherlands, is building an AI to solve poverty in Africa. Hmm, weird. And he has probably, he's just passionate and has never probably stepped in Africa. How does he intend to train an AI model to do that? The only way would probably be to collaborate with someone from Africa but let's think about it. Africa is 54 countries. With, for in Nigeria alone, you have like 200 languages. The only way is to ensure that there is engagement from these communities. With the way we have, okay, for example, 
Kubernetes. Kubernetes is big today because, oh, Google donated it. It's out there. Lots of contributions from different parts of the world. People adding their own use cases. Almost, it's like the JavaScript ecosystem. Almost every day there are new things, new projects that are coming up, are being donated to the CNCF to build the Kubernetes ecosystem. The same thing with communities. I always give example of Google in the reach they have in the community. There's this program they have that's called GDG, Google Developer Groups. They ensured that in almost every part of the globe, it might not be popular in the EU, in the US, no. Nah. But when you go to Sub-Saharan Africa, you go to Middle East and North Africa and Asia, it's huge. Thousands of members. Most, and they even have Google Developer Student Club, GDSC. So when it comes to, hey, we want to do a hackathon to map locations across the globe, they know to tap those community. Who will go to their localities, oh, add this data, confirm these locations. It's the same way that we can have this diversity of knowledge. Because you cannot say, we've been in situations whereby, oh, you've mapped, I'm driving from this location to this location, and all of a sudden you find yourself in some empty road, nowhere. I think there was a time I was going to uh, the Greek embassy in Abuja, Nigeria, plotted it on Google Maps. The next thing, just find myself in front of a random building, you've arrived. <laughs> so, Someone in Seattle or Silicon Valley cannot identify why that was wrong. But someone that is based in Abuja can say, oh, this is wrong. This is the correct location. It's the same way we can have that diversity of knowledge to feed into AI. Now, transparency and accountability. A lot of AI models, the data they use are closed. It's now, I think we are probably learning about, oh, uh, OpenAI or some company trained itself on YouTube videos secretly, or uh, I think there was a time there was some news about some AI model using several accounts to watch Netflix series and videos to get all the data. It's now that we are knowing some of them. That's why you'd be wondering how did AI arrive at this result or this response that it's giving? Having transparency and accountability is extremely crucial. And that brings us to explainable AI. Now, we all have trust issues with AI. Yeah, definitely. Because even with, uh, I've seen a lot of videos where uh, people are using self-driving cars, but the government say, yeah, you can use it, but you should remain near the a steering wheel in case that means we don't trust the system and one of the reasons why we don't trust the systems is how does it make the decisions how did it arrive at the result or the decision that it decided to give oh if an ai is probably telling you you should fire this person why you'll be able to trust his decision more or as an hr manager you'll be able to say, okay, this AI is correct because this is how it arrived at the decision. That is where explainable AI is extremely important. And it also gives us the opportunity to fix biases and to fix issues in how it arrived at its result. Maybe it's through the data set, or maybe it's through the algorithm, or maybe it's through something along the way that made it to make a wrong assumption or presents the wrong data, like the person that killed himself because the AI suggested, we can check where did it get wrong? Or even before it gets to that point, we will have seen, okay, there's something fundamentally wrong with this. Let's fix it. Now, this brings us to OpenAI. There's been a lot of discussions about OpenAI. Yeah, we have a lot of open models and open AI tools, Llama, Gemma, and the rest that are out there. But are they really open? Because those that are actually being used in the tools we use every day are in the blue. No access. 
You don't have access to the models of ChatGPT. You don't have access to the models of Gemini. You don't have access to the models used for Apple intelligence. Yeah, we have a very big green, but are they actually being used in the tools we use day to day? That is the question. The open is just to say, hey, yeah, we are giving something back to the community that they can experiment with if they have the resources to experiment with it. Because it brings us to the idea of training some of these models is extremely expensive. Because if you as a community comes up, oh, we want to train our own model to be more diverse, to have more diverse data, huh? Do you have the GPUs to do that? Do you have the billions of dollars to spend into this? No, you don't. That is why we have communities like on Kabul. Kabul has been, yeah, a place where some of these open models that we've been seeing have been published, but not just the model, the data sets. You can see some of the data sets that people have seen. Oh, I can say, for example, huh, I want to, everyone talks about, oh, Nigeria is, has 200 languages, this, that. Now, so there can be more representation out there, let me get a data set of the distribution of the languages, the this, that, and upload to the world. So when someone is building something that applies to Africa or applies to Nigeria, they have a data set to use. Then maybe, for example, someone in northeastern part of Nigeria, like there's a state called Borno State, Meduguri, suddenly says, huh, this is wrong. You can see the data set, join the discussions, suggest, oh, this is wrong, this is actually the correct thing. Contribute to it, then we have more accurate data. Or maybe because, yeah, politics is everywhere. Because I'm from the north, I mistakenly represented some data for some location in the south, and someone from the south, from the north, decides, huh, no, this can be used politically. We all know how the, all, the politics go in all the countries. We can, all this data is there. It's not someone playing with numbers. The data is there and everyone can contribute for us to have a fairer data set. The same thing with uh, hugging face models publishing being published every day and date especially data set being published every day but where i want to get to is this graph that was shared by hugging face yeah oh sorry you wanted to snap something oh okay yeah this report shared by hugging face where they said there have been a number of reports that people share in their community and some of them are closed by members of the community but then, if you look at it, a lot of them are copyright and technical. Yeah, which is because a lot of people in that community are very technical. They're the data scientists, they can easily spot something technically wrong from afar. But then there's not a lot of engagement from the ethical perspective. And this is the number we want to push up by getting more people to join some of these communities. And this presents some challenges. I mentioned earlier about resource. A lot of resources is expended to train these models, to gather these data sets. If there's no incentive, I will not just go start going around my community and start mapping locations and start interviewing people just randomly. No. One of the ways that this can be uh, done through open source communities. Is a lot of uh, achievements that we get from open source communities is because of a student who is passionate and wants to prove him or herself, wants to show on his CV that he has this experience or has a badge like the Linux Foundation CNCF gives. They have some incentive to contribute. That is one way we can solve it. But then we have a problem with sustainability of some of this, even in the current open source community. Uh, there's this project by a GitOps company that folded, I've forgotten the name of the company. The Ago CD or which one I've, I've forgotten. Uh, WeWorks. Yeah, WeWorks. The company went, uh, well, I won't say closed. Let me use the word closed. 
But now they need help with the community because with the company closing, most of the maintainers and others are from the company. Now what happens to the community? Which was a challenge. In the last KubeCon, they had to hold a special session to ask more like a call for help. It's one of the problems we have with in open source. But then it will be a problem in the open source community because, okay, you're generating this data set, you are creating this model, you don't have a resource. Probably the best GPU you have is the one you use to game at home or the one that came with your Mac. This resource constraint is a huge problem that can only be solved by having foundations of communities that can fund maybe a central training infrastructure or resources or facilities somewhere. For example, like I'll use Kubernetes as an, as an example. A lot of companies donate resources, VP, CPU hours, and so on. A lot of the cloud providers donate. It's the same way we can, if we have a foundation for the open, uh, open source AI, where we can get resources donated. It might be GPUs, it might be skilled engineers, because expertise is also a problem. Skilled engineers who can help the community set up some of these cloud GPUs and also help maintain the community. Another thing is the ed education. Education, because yeah, a lot of people just want to show themselves. It might be that some of their knowledge is not adequate enough for them to participate, but they are passionate. One of the things with, uh, for example, the Linux, Linux Foundation is the mentorship program, which is a huge thing that will allow us to have more transfer of knowledge. A lot of knowledge are in the Google team, the uh, OpenAI team and so on. But we are having a lot more knowledge coming out now and having more mentors from a lot of these companies who are doing top notch high tech things will allow us to have more sustainability within uh, the community. I've talked about uh, education, incentives, collaboration is a big thing. Yeah, now a lot of these companies are well, I won't say open, yeah, open sourcing some parts of their models. Oh, you have Gemma, you have Llama, you have a number of them. But being actively part of a foundation where they contribute to, okay, maybe we have a model created by some organization like the Linux Foundation or the OpenAI. Let's say we have OpenAI Foundation, we have a model. Everyone is contributing to it. Everyone can adapt it. We have an open data set. People have a way to feed data and the LLM more like a, uh, how do I put it, almighty model, for example, like Kubernetes, where everyone can contribute to, everyone can collaborate with and adapt in their various forms. It could be one of the ways that we can use open source to solve some of the issues we have with bias, but the key thing is not even the models themselves, but the data that they are trained on, the data sets that they are trained on. Now, that's uh, like most of the things that uh, I have. So I don't know if any of you have maybe some from some of the things I've shared some ideas around how we can use uh, open source to solve AI, or if you have some questions from some of the things I've shared. Any ideas or maybe some, the essence of this session is uh, why it's listed on that bit of a feather, is for us to have a conversation and share ideas. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think for the, I know for Kubernetes, for example, to run their CI, their builds and so on, a lot of these cloud providers donate cloud resources to the CNCF foundation. We can have uh, something similar to where GPU resources and everything is donated to a foundation. The 
And the good thing is you are getting innovation, you are getting contribution, you are getting diversity of content data sets from the community. So it's like, as a company, you are donating back to the community. Any other ideas or? Or maybe some other suggestion on how we can uh, we can build these communities because most of the activities happening is in some forum or some discussion somewhere. I think it's now that there is a lot of okay. Yeah, he wants to say something. Uh, you know, Yeah. One direction yeah. Uh, or uh, another direction. Um, and um, I wonder about tools, not so much uh, about feedback to AI as feedback to one another. Yeah. <laughs> right? But to use AI to uh, kind of provide feedback yeah. on, on uh, what we might communicate to each other, certainly there are some dangers, right? Yeah. Which is, yeah. You know, they can be hijacked by, yeah. um, you know, by a, a bad actor. Yeah. But I, I think there's a potential for more effective feedback, you know, especially given your, co your conversation about um, uh, 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 resources. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think first, I think the first thing you brought up is one way we can uh, uh, we can start solving this is to listen to one another first and also be open-minded. Because sometimes we already have how we see things and how we want to see things. So even when someone is bringing some genuine data, some genuine information, from, uh, for it's about cognitive diversity. You don't know everything. I don't know everything, but we have, there's that Venn diagram middle place. Let's say we, we both share some knowledge, but there's some parts where I have more information to give you about a topic that you probably hold there. For example, like the Delve issue. Yeah, there, was, there has been an optic. If you present a chart in different form, it can tell whatever story you wanted to say. But then understanding and identifying that there are certain people who might be using this word differently. One of the things that was not seen in that Twitter conversation is the open-mindedness to listen to other people who have been using these words and why they've been using it. So the first thing is being open-minded as a community to listen to one another and then take this information and use it as necessary. Then the other thing is the uh, other part where you said about the AI, uh, the uh, 
feedback from AI. Yeah, I think it's tools and resources that need to be built in understanding that, okay, when AI uh, generates content in a certain form and feedback is given, we should have processes in place to identify some of this feedback that has been shared and maybe retrain the model. I don't know if I'm answering your question. Yeah, right. yeah. We, uh, CDs is a great example. Yeah. Very noisy. Yeah, yeah. Domain, yeah. Where, uh, uh, I'll give you an example. I got some guys here for them. He said um, the, the most common label of versions is latest. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. And so uh, finding a way to use some of these automation tools to say, well, uh, it's this, you know, here's how likely this is, or here how common this is, or. Yeah. 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 I think that is where the explainable AI part comes in because you are not just seeing the end result, you are seeing the every stage and every resource that was used to arrive at that decision. Then as a user and you've seen or maybe it gave you a response and like, huh, this response is fishy. Let me check how it arrived at this decision. And you see a part in it where, okay, this maybe the, at this data set that was used at this point is questionable. Then I flag it. Now flagging it to probably points to maybe some admin or some uh, maybe a maintainer somewhere to investigate for that. I think it's one of the things to reduce biases to ensure that we can check this AI, the responses they are giving to us, what they use to arrive at those decisions check them, remove those things, or we are possibly train the models or change the data set that we are used to train the models. So I think explainable AI is one way we can, we can get more feedback and get more solutions to that, yeah. 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 Where it starts from over and then understand. So how you want to explain it? It's somehow philosophically also mm -hmm. a little bit problematic. Although if it's uh, reinforcement, reinforcement learning is yeah. another story. You can flag the terms can be lost a bit. Yeah. But in the deep learning, it's uh, I don't know how we want to achieve that. Uh, at least I'm not very optimistic in this era. <laughs> Maybe next two three years. <laughs> Okay. Which you could combine um, reinforcement learning with the deep learning model. Because let me tell you something very philosophically in my in terms of that yeah. to understand what I'm talking. Um, because even the paper could be biased. I yeah. look at the paper. Yeah. So I am a historian yeah. and I am a I don't know, I'm, let's say I'm for the left or right. Yeah. I would definitely in the conclusion be biased. Yeah. Yeah. There, there would be bias. Yeah. It's uh, for me at least it's obvious. So as long as we can put these things that the machine itself decides without human observation interaction at the same time control it somehow, yeah. maybe we could get rid of bias. But then we have also to explain it to people like some scammer don't write a book that hey AI is coming and eating you, that's also part of it. So it's a combination of a lot of things at the same time, um, but yeah, I, I guess I, I pointed out. Yeah, I think that is where responsible AI comes in. When we have foundations like this, we can have uh, maybe uh, like a body or committee that defines for the AI models. Yeah, if this is written this way or that is written this way, we should have a system to agree on, okay, this is the... Uh, 
the right uh, data that should be used to train the models. Sorry, you were raising your hand. Yeah. About the, the child and the old lady. Yeah. And what does the car should do <laughs> if it's an accident, right? Should should go to the right or to the left? I mean both the cars needs to make a decision and yeah. it comes to everything. So I think finding the limitations of something yeah. helps you, as I said, to open your mind to say, Okay, you have a hammer, not everything has a face of a nail. Let's yeah. try let's try to make a decision based on not cognitive yeah. And I would think uh, trying to solve the specific problem would be the first step. Yeah. As an example, I think in the Netherlands, for instance, we yeah. have mortgages, in order to give mortgages to people, a lot of banks use algorithms. Yeah. And for sure, I can say about explainable enough. Yeah. If for some reason somebody or a European citizen gets denied of something, which yeah. is the rights, you need to be able to explain how did you train that machine learning. Yeah. Forget about the yeah. How did you get to come to the conclusion that this person yeah. should not fit the risk profile? Yeah. And that reversible way of getting to to the bottom of your decision. Yeah. Kind of decision in the jury. I think it's what we need people to be more aware of. Yeah, and one other thing back to the point he's making is we, when we have foundations where a lot of these companies come together and we agree on certain things around responsibility on AI, it will at least advance us to an extent. You understand? We cannot solve the problem 100%, but at least it can advance us to a stage whereby, okay, we all agree on certain things on how we should do things. And definitely if someone is not meeting those expectations, it, is clearly, it can clearly be seen that, okay, this person is doing something wrong. So I think that's one way we can, to an extent, to an extent, yeah, it is a temporary solution. There, there will never be a permanent solution. It's just for us to get to a point whereby, okay, it's acceptable. We've gotten to an act no, acceptable let's, stage. Let's take a look at it morally because at the beginning it's good, but yeah. it goes far, far, far. At some point, it is the other way in point. Yeah. So you know I mean? Yeah, I understand. happens and we know from the history, we learn it. Yeah. Also, kind of, we have no relief, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. We have to put all the, the terms ethic, yeah. Uh, explainable. Yeah, e explainability is extremely important because if I need to trust this, I need to know how it got to the results that it's giving me. Yeah. I think it's uh, we are time. Thank you very much. It was a very great discussion. Thank you very much for joining me. <laughs>